I'm delighted today to be sitting with Ralph White, an old colleague, both from Finthorn and from New York. So I'd like to begin, Ralph, by asking you um, why you accepted our invitation to become a Finthorn Fellow. Wow. Hmm. I thought it was sweet. You know, I mean, I, I feel a, uh, a connection to Finthorn. I mean, I was here for three and a half years in the 70s, from 76 to 79. But I feel an ongoing sense of connection to Finthorn. I always appreciated the way you carried more of the, uh, what should we call it, more of the intellectual or so dimension of, uh, of Finthorn. I think it's really good that that has been established through the whole Fellows program. So uh, I liked the concept and I was happy to make a statement about my own sense of ongoing spiritual connection to Finthorn. And how would you describe that spiritual connection? You know, a lot of it is the people. I, uh, I have lifelong friends here, people I've known now for 40 years, and in some cases I didn't see them for 35 years, and yet when I saw them again it was as if I'd seen them the day before. To me that's a tremendous testimony to the authenticity, to the reality of what uh, Findhorn embodies, that these heart connections, these soul connections are so strong that they endure in that way, they have an eternal quality about them. So part of it is the human warmth and love and friendship and uh, part of it is just that beautiful commitment to the spirituality and the intelligence of nature that Findhorn really expresses. I've always felt close to that. I love the nature of Scotland um, and yeah, it's, it's the attunement to the natural world and the fact that Finthorn really did a lot to pioneer what is increasingly mainstream now. In terms of, and, and of course, Finthorn was green before it was fashionable to be green because of the spiritual notion of the spiritual mm. forces that live within and behind nature. So Finthorn came to it not out of uh, a social trend or out of fashion, but out of genuine spiritual insight. And I think that's what enabled Findhorn to be ahead of the game and to now be one of the places on the face of the earth with the lowest carbon footprint. So I think the values, the practice, you know, I've always liked about Findhorn that it saw itself, part of the original vision was to see itself as a center of demonstration, demonstrating that you could live in harmony with nature and largely speaking in harmony with each other. Um, so I, I, I think the values and the vision and the sustainability of Finton, just the fact that it's been going for 60 plus years now, I think that's a real accomplishment. It is, and I'm happy to say that I couldn't have said it better myself. Thank you very much. Oh, my pleasure. <laughs> so, uh, on this occasion, you come to us having published recently your autobiography, The Jeweled Highway, on the quest for a life of meaning. And I believe that last night you regaled some 30 or so of us, uh, with stories from that book. But I also seem to recall that you were able to synopsize it reasonably succinctly at the beginning, and I wonder if you could take another oh, stab yeah. at it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in uh, three minutes or less. Uh, well, it is, yes, it's my memoir. It's, uh, it, it begins with... Uh, my own childhood in Wales on the working class terraced back streets of Cardiff and then moving as a boy to the, the coast of North Wales on the Irish Sea, Penryn Bay near Llandidno, um, which has a very special place in my memory. I must say that was my, my own natural predisposition towards being a nature mystic, I think found a natural. Um, way to express itself within that, just walking those beautiful tidal shores, the rhythm of the sea, the cry of the seagulls. Uh, I loved being in North Wales, actually. But then at the age of nine, through my job, my father's job changing, <coughs> we moved to the industrial north of England, which was a, a kind of Huddersfield, 
which back in 1958 was it was the archetypal grim satanic mills I'll never forget look, waking up that first morning and looking down on what 50 60 chimneys belching smoke into the atmosphere the whole town jet black you know the world's original proletariat where Marx and Engels thought the revolution was going to happen that was a very rough shock for me <clears throat> I would say the biggest uh, culture shock I've ever been through in fact um, but we had the saving grace of the rock and roll that came out of Liverpool and Manchester and the Mersey beat and so on that helped me get through but anyway I, I managed to get away I knew I needed to get out of that world my nightmare was that I would be stuck and never leave that grim northern industrial vibe um, but I left I went to university I, I got away to a place called Sussex University, which back in the 60s was sort of the academic equivalent of swinging London, you know, it was mini skirts and Jimi Hendrix at the Student Union and this kind of thing. And that was great. And I got and I did a pro I did a degree in American studies in those days when it was rare. Mm -hmm. And then I felt, well, what's the point of doing a degree in American studies about going to America? I'd never been there. So then I went to I got a gig as a graduate uh, a teaching assistant in uh, in Chicago. So I went to Chicago and then the very first Christmas in Chicago I, I was thinking I wanted to go to California. You know the first American novel I had read was The Grapes of Wrath by John Steinbeck about those Okies going down Route 66 and of course that famous song, it was the first track of the Rolling Stones, first LP, Route 66, you have, you, you know, you have a plan to motor west, taxi my way, that's the best, take the highway, that's the best, get your kicks on Route 66. So that's what I wanted to, so I answered an ad. Somebody just put a little sign up on the door and bam, she and I met, we clicked and bam, we set off a matter of days later down Route 66. And that was the spiritual turning point of the archetypal American road journey in the deserts of New Mexico, Arizona, the stars, the silence, hearing the pure sound of silence on 15th century Native American ruins in the painted desert. That became a whole, unexpectedly for me, it became a, that was a spiritual awakening for me. I think there were inner processes. I was 21 years old at the time. I think the inner and the outer met. Something within my own soul was ready to emerge. And also, I think the macrocosm of just those incredible deserts, the silence, the stars, something awoke in me and really set me on the spiritual path. And then I felt, look, if these experiences are real, nothing could be more important. Of course, I, I wasn't really sure at that time if I was heading towards psychosis or enlightenment, or in fact, if there was any difference between the two at the time. <laughs> but I, uh, I kissed goodbye to graduate school. I, really, I was really in America to experience America rather than to do a graduate degree. And I wound up moving to the West Coast, to Vancouver, and immersing myself in a study of the mystical, the spiritual, and the esoteric, seeking to con feel whether, it was, uh, whether that was real and whether it was true. So Machu Picchu. So when I was 23, I, hitch I hitchhiked to Machu Picchu. Uh, wound up living in South America for, or Latin America for about a year and two thirds or so. Had many profound experiences there, uh, both at Machu Picchu itself, at Lake Titicaca, being in the Andes. I mentioned the old the to total eclipse of the sun and the Kahutic comet in the mountains of Bogota. The, I had many profound spiritual experiences there. I must say, you know. Mm -hmm that amplified my experience in the deserts of the Southwest. So then when I left there, finally got out. So can I just ask you what you understand by the phrase spiritual experience? Well, great question, Roger. <laughs> um, what would I say? I would say, uh, by spiritual experience, I would say a sense of oneness, unity with the natural world, a sense of awe and wonder a sense of um, transcendence. transcendence. Uh, it can also, on a more inner personal level, relate to an awakening of that element within, whatever you want to call it, that transcendent factor, whether you want to call it the Buddha within or whatever you want to call it, uh, an awakening of that sense of that divine spark that we all carry within us mm. and so rather than having a sense of that as a theory or reading about it actually having the direct personal experience and I've never been I was never a person of religious faith for me I'm interested in gnosis not faith and dogma so I was in, I've always been interested in actual living spiritual experience so for me all these journeys and travels were actually crucial 
in giving me those experiences. So by the time I, so when I left South America, you know, I went to California, I was there exploring various practices like uh, the Arica Institute and so on, seeking to replicate some of the experiences I'd had in the mountains. But then by the time I got to be 26 or so, I, fe I felt I had arrived at a, a worldview, a spiritual, a holistic, and ecological worldview. I'd actually had an experience coming down from being in the mountains, seeing Western industrial civilization again with fresh eyes. Even it was the Peruvian town of Arequipa, and I remember having one of those moments of direct intuitive knowing this would be in 1973 that uh, Western industrial civilization was destroying the planet and destroying our own souls, or at least <laughs> deeply damaging them both, and, uh, and that we had to create some kind of alternative. So looking back, I'd say hitchhiking to Machu Picchu was some kind of a vision quest. I, I had no concept of a vision quest, but I, I feel grateful that as a result of that, I did gain an insight into the fact that we needed to build an alternative to this pathological worldview and the, the, uh, the environment that it was creating. And so when I found out about Findholm when I was in California, I, w I was drawn to the fact that it was a center of demonstration, that it wanted to demonstrate these, that you really could live together. And also, you know, I've never been oriented towards uh, Eastern gurus and so on. Good luck to the people who are, but it's not my path. And I like the fact that really the spiritual attunement to nature was at the heart of the Findhorn mm. spiritual experience. I was comfortable with that. And I wanted to come back to uh, Britain again. After being, I realized that after traveling to all these exotic places that right back in my own native land, there was all the mystery and mysticism and esotericism that anybody could possibly want. So that's what brought me back here. And, uh, so I was one of the original group of Clooney loonies, 30 or so of us, who, uh, who started off Clooney Hill with those coach parties showing up. Where mm. so so in 75, we bought Clooney Hill, right? We that? bought it in 70, yeah, 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 we think we bought it in 75. And then um, I remember being the, also the, the commemoration, 100th 100, 100 anniversary of some esoteric, um, Madame Lovatsky perhaps, or the... Uh, well, yes, that's right, 1875, Madame Blavatsky founded the Theosophical Society in New York City at Mott Memorial Hall, two blocks from where the New York Open Center is today, the, is place, that right? the place that I co-founded in New York City. It doesn't exist anymore, but literally, yes, we're at 30th and Madison Avenue, and, she, and Mott Memorial Hall was 28th and Madison. We've done walking tours of esoteric New York City, you know. That's, right. that's where that's Madame right. Blavatsky wrote really? Isis Unveiled. Oh, that would be wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Do that. yeah. So anyway, in 1975, we bought Clooney Hill, and you were part of the first bunch that came to uh, yeah. service the coach party, yeah. which was, we <laughs> were right. previously committed to. Yeah. How was that? It was a laugh, you know. I mean, I'm, uh, I'm bonded with uh, that group of people for life, like I am with uh, many people I knew in those days at Fenton. You know, yeah, I mean, the, the coaches would pull up and we'd, you know, we'd run up there and grab their suitcases and carry them up to their rooms and they'd give us a 10p tip. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and then, you know, and then we, we'd, we'd return to being citizens of the new age <laughs> afterwards. So it was a funny <laughs> world. But I remember the first group was a bunch of old age pensioners. They came, they stayed a week. It rained nonstop for the whole week, but they loved it. And at the end, they said we'd revived their faith in human nature. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, that was it. Was crazy, you know. I mean, I mean, I wound up working in maintenance. What I know about maintenance, I, I put that story in the book. At Stan and I, you know, Stan the man. <laughs> He and I were the maintenance team. He knew even less than I did. We, we, at least I knew how to screw in a light bulb. We were trying to screw. We were trying to screw something into the wall in the lounge at Clooney Hill. And Stan says to me, "Well, we're in Scotland here. They drive on the left. Maybe we should screw it into the left." <laughs> I thought, "Mike, we're supposed to be in charge of the maintenance of like a hundred and fifty-year-old building this for." <laughs> Fortunately, Edward Paul showed up, you know, from Hawaii, and he was a trained pipe fitter. So uh, <laughs> the place didn't fall apart at the seams. So, yeah, it was, I, I, I loved it. And, uh, yeah, those first couple of years at Findhorn were truly magical. You did feel, when you came to Findhorn after being away, that you almost walked through a palpable membrane of love. Yeah. You know, I'd followed a kind of a lonely, isolated path with all these journeyings. I hadn't known many other people who had been on that path. And so coming here to Finton, it was, as I call the chapter in my book, I think I called it uh, 
the heart expands, the soul finds community, or something mm. like that. And so, yeah, just just the warmth, the healing, the nourishment, the sense that you know we're part of uh, a global phenomenon too. Because I was resonated with Eileen's inner vision of the network of light. You know, that must have been a stretch. It must have been in 1962 for was a three broke people in this little caravan park. And with her having this notion that, that Findholm would become a center of light and then it would become part of a planetary network of light. Before we move on, I just wanted to call your attention to a piece I read in the New York Times um, a couple of days ago by, I guess, guy David Brooks is one of their yeah. columnists. It was called The Wealth Fallacy. But he was talking about the way in which... Um, it's almost two archetypal uh, forces in all of our psyches, one towards autonomy and the other towards community. Hmm. You know, your story reminds me of that, you know, basically this lonely quest around all kinds of places in the world before you eventually find your way here and uh, get overwhelmed in a sense, bathed in community, mm -hmm. which is, of course, a very powerful experience for virtually everybody who comes here. Mm. I mean, I think I, if it's any is any common core to people's experience here, it is a sense that they are no longer alone. Mm, yeah, exactly. Uh, and that's, you know, that's, that's, that's a power of the place as well. Mm -hmm. Anyway, you were here for several years and then you moved on down the Primrose Path towards? I wound up becoming Program Director of Omega Institute for Holistic Studies, which is in upstate New York near Rhinebeck, about an hour and a half north of New York City. It, it's now very well established. But uh, through somebody I had met on a trip to America, uh, on a visit to the new Renaissance community in Turner's Falls, I'd met a Sufi named Lucius there, and uh, he invited me after that year in California, I'd sent him a Christmas card, he invited me to come over and work with them in running this new place called Omega Institute, which initially was an offshoot of the abode of the message, a Sufi community established by Pia Vilayat Khan. So, yes, anyway, to cut a long story short, we, yes, I, I wound up creating the programs with a woman called Ursula, and um, for that would have been the summer of 1982, except uh, um, Omega had nowhere to go, and then at the last minute, after the programs were created and the brochure was about to be printed, we finally found this old summer camp, Camp Boybrick, an old Yiddish-speaking summer camp, a sort of an extended part of the Borscht Belt, and that had been in ruins, well, not exactly ruins, it had been crumbling, it had been neglected and abandoned for 10 years. And, uh, yeah, I always remember <coughs> showing up there on a, some icy, windswept day. It was a low, gray, cloudy sky. There was an icy wind blowing. It was covered in snow. And just going around these, there were, there were 85 or buildings on 108 acres. A lot of them were ramshackle and run down. And it was freezing cold, and I'm oh like, are we going to turn this thing? Because unlike Clooney Hill, where there had been, you know, a couple of hundred people at Fenton at that time, there were only seven of us, you know, how on earth are we going to renovate this mess in just a few months? And of course, there was no, we did, there was just enough money left to rent it for the summer, then maybe with an option to buy if the summer were, but it was basically one roll of the dice. <clears throat> Unfortunately, people loved it, even though it was ramshackle and run down. And I, and I was up there, up on a ladder of the main hall the day before it began, painting out the old religious statements on the door or up on the wall. People loved the ambience. You know, they loved the fact that Omega was able to create its own <clears throat> atmosphere and environment, and uh, they forgave the fact that I wasn't sure a meal would ever come, an edible meal would ever come out of that kitchen. <laughs> You know, not when I'd yanked open that rusted pantry drawer and this huge rat had bared its yellow teeth at me and I thought, oh, God, slam that door. Like, you, we are, this is impossible. <laughs> but but, uh, but somehow we pulled it off. Anyway, that's a reprise of, of what happened to Clooney Hill, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I mean, exactly, Clooney Hill and, uh, and Camp Boybrick or Omega Institute as it now is. Yeah, they were both white elephants, ramshackle white mm -hmm. elephants. Mm -hmm. At least Clooney Hill had been occupied by, you know, the regular coach parties, etc., during the summers. Tom uh, Wells used to go on about how the, the, you know, out of the shell of the old, the, the new pearl would be uh, yeah, conceived yeah, yeah. and created. Yeah, that's, that's a nice way to put it. And you could say something similar happened uh, 
at Omega. We had thematic, I remember doing the, the creating a week of the way of social transformation, did we call it? We had all round us there and we, I brought in the people from Greenpeace and Oxfam and Amnesty International for a dialogue with round us for a week. That was my favorite week, that first week there. And of course we had people from all the different spiritual paths, uh, Zen masters and uh, Kabbalists and so on there. So I made a lot of very good connections there. I, we put on two extremely successful summers. And then I left there after a few years. I really wasn't cut out for living in upstate New York. And um, through a twist of fate, a synchronicity, through meeting somebody at this lake at Omega who I remembered from Findhorn, an Australian guy called Michael Riddell, he introduced me to somebody in New York called uh, Walter Beebe, who was one of a small group of people wanting to create something in New York because New York didn't have a, a holistic center. You know, Walter and I met and decided to work together and decided to give it a shot. You know, I had the background and the know-how and the connections, and he had some resources, and he was a lawyer, and he knew how to do the the uh, the nonprofit thing, and he had an eye for real estate and so on. So we managed to find a building in a dangerous, fairly dangerous part of downtown Manhattan at the time. There was nothing else lit up after dark down in Soho back in 1983. And we launched on that date, I always remember, January, Friday the 13th, 1984. In New York, the place they said it could never be done because of course New York in the late 70s, early 80s, really right up until the early 90s, it was an incredible dive. I mean, it was mayhem, it was tremendous levels of violence and uh, grime <laughs> and, uh, and <clears throat> racial tension and, you know, spiraling murder rates and so on. And, uh, and the conventional, I mean, certainly a lot of people felt, oh, this is a, a ridiculously quixotic venture. As I said last night, people thought, well, yeah, maybe you can do this in California. We've got Esalen Institute and so on, or maybe Hawaii, possibly Colorado, but New York, get out of here, it's the real world. So <clears throat> it was a bit of a formidable undertaking, but fortunately we had the, uh, the know-how and the resources to be able to pull it off, and, uh, and it worked bit by bit by bit. I remember so, that by the time I got there in 1992, um, just to spend a year working with the Open Center, um, Virtually, I think at least half of the bestseller list, the New York Times bestseller list, would include works of this genre, namely holistic. Yeah, yeah, you, you, know, you had Fritjof Capra and Gary Zukav and uh, and all these kinds of people. Now it's extraordinary. And now today, you know, there's a there's a yoga center on every fifth or sixth street corner in Manhattan. The largest grocery store is Whole Foods. We have, uh, that's Bloom Mayor Bloomberg's, I think, best legacy is that he created this Plan YC to create New York as a model echo city for mm. the 21st century. Who would have imagined that in 1983? Indeed. Indeed. So we, we planted a million trees and more and more you know, buses are going hybrid and we've re rediscovered the waterfront, etc. So New York today is unrecognizable from the way it was 30 odd years ago. You know, we did a, we did a big event here, um, largely um, inspired and coordinated by Finthorn Fellows, called the, the New Story Summit. Mm. Almost everybody who came here came because they were feeling as though there was some kind of nascent new story emerging um, everywhere, and that they were somehow or other a part of it. Mm. I'd be curious to hear what you think about that. I mean, your story is personally fascinating uh, and indeed inspirational. Um, in terms of what you've been able to achieve, but I wonder if what you if you if you see signs of a genuine new story emerging everywhere, and if so, what you see to be its parameters. Well, yes, I think there is a new culture emerging or a new story. I mean, we, we and I think we could. What I was just saying there, the way the so many of these holistic and ecological, even latently spiritual things were on the periphery just even thirty years ago, and how much more they've moved to the heart of it all. Um, as I was saying, that the New York Times never published anything like this all those years ago. In fact, it was antithetical to it. Whereas now, if you've got the eye for it, um, 
Right, there's at least twice a week, or there's some, or maybe more, may, or sometimes more often. There is uh, there's something in the Times that somehow addresses this, if you've got the eye for it. So whether it's renewable energy, or whether it's complementary and integrative medicine, yeah. or whether it's the rise of retreat centers and people needing to get away from the rat race, or whether of course it's mindfulness meditation, which is <clears throat> ubiquitous now. I'm always saying to Nanette, wherever we go, it's everywhere. You know, you get off the plane in San Francisco, the first thing you see is a kiosk selling totally sustainable products and so on. So once you've got the eye for it, you can see that that new, new story is really starting to come through. But because it's a subtle process, it's not a political revolution, it's a subtle cultural uh, evolution, it's beneath the radar of most of the media. That's why I was delighted to see CNN mm -hmm. and CNBC doing that, those two pieces on Findhorn recently. And I got a message from the uh, the editor of um, Growth Strategy at the New York Times. He just sent out a mess asking for feedback. But I actually wrote back to him saying that the Times should do more more stories on all of these things, on the emerging holistic and ecological worldview. And he wrote back to me just a few days ago saying thanks for getting in touch. And in fact, a number of people have really suggested this. And we're, I, I, you know, and so I hope that that will lead to an even stronger emphasis because the fact is that that way of looking at things represents the hope for a sustainable humanity. If we don't go that end, you know, it's just going to be global warming and climactic madness and the progressive alienation and despair in the cities and that this, this is actually what represents the hope for a healthy human future. And it's not just a bunch of you know mystics uh, up in a windswept caravan park in the north of Scotland. It's a universal thing. And as I was saying last night, it's it's even emerging in places like China now. So you know you can't keep the people down. They will only accept a materialist or consumerist worldview for so long. At some point, they'll either get the feedback from the external environment, or there will be enough of a yearning arising in people's hearts to demand something different. Unfortunately, we're living in an age where we have access to the whole collective spiritual history of humanity, at least that, the, the part of it that's been recorded. So uh, I think we have enormous resources, and of course we have, we have the freedom to explore all these different paths. So yes, I'm, I think that's absolutely true, that there is a new culture or a new story emerging bit by bit. Um, but I remain uh, optimistic and encouraged. Of course, we have the regressive forces that go counter that, mm. and the Rudolf Steiner, I think, described very accurately after the First World War in 1919 when he spoke about how these regressive forces would emerge, they would grow stronger, it would be part of the struggle for the human future, struggle for the soul of humanity, and he nailed it for a hundred years ago almost. Uh, with what he described when he said that the, the, those regressive forces would take four primary forms, religious fundamentalism, the primacy of economic values in all spheres, think of corporate globalization, um, you know, grotesque forms of nationalism and tribalism, <laughs> we'd have to look far to see that one. And then I love this phrase of his, the superstition of scientific materialism. <laughs> of course, those, love, those people love to think that they're the realists and we're, we're a bunch of space cadets living in a fantasy world. They're the ones living in the superstition. And of course, barely a, a year goes by without some incredible discovery about you know, dark matter or some vast dimension of the universe that we didn't even glimpse before. And we didn't even know electricity existed 150 years ago or so, or maybe there were glimpses of it. But... Uh, <clears throat> Think of what we learn, what science discovers every year. Uh, we're living in an infinitely vast universe. You know, I always remember when I was living in Berkeley, California, somebody I knew was monitoring an astronomy class at, at Berkeley, and uh, I remember him coming in one evening and saying, you know, they've discovered that some of those tiny little specks of light on the visible, on the edge of the universe, they're not just planets, of course, they're not stars, nor are they just solar systems. In fact, they aren't even just galaxies. These tiny specks on the edge of the universe are galaxies of galaxies. And we think that we've figured this whole thing out. Um, I think scientific materialism is going gonna, is gonna to go the way of a superstition eventually. We're going to realize we're part of a much deeper, richer, more mysterious universe than people imagine. What single thing gives you the most hope at the moment? Mm. What single thing does give me? 
Well, <clears throat> I think the fact that we're awakening to global warming, mm. that, uh, you know, I had that intuition, as I mentioned, back in South America, back in 73, that uh, Western industrial civilization was destroying the ecological balance of the planet. So it's been obvious to me for a long, long time that we were heading towards something catastrophic. So the fact that science is now validated will recognize that this is going on. And, and, and so it's fundamentally necessary to switch in that direction. And I think the, you know, the breakthroughs in wind power and solar power and so on, I think, I think this is extremely helpful. For And then just what I was mentioning, the fact that whether it's uh, columnists in the New York Times writing about it, um, David Brooks, when he avoids politics and covers culture, is actually very good. And um, <clears throat> so I think, you know, thoughtful columnists are writing about this now. They're seeing it. They're seeing it's a reaction against the atomism, the empty consumerism of American society, the alienation of suburbia. You know, more and more people are choosing to live in semi-urban environments where there's, like there is at Fendon, there's a sense of community. You know, you're not spending six hours a night watching television in your lonely little suburban ranch house. Uh, you know, you're going out. That's one of the things I love about Long Island City, where we live in New York, you know. You've got cafes, bars, restaurants, and even though we're only one stop from Grand Central Station, it's just the other side of the East River. It was a forgotten old neighborhood for 50, 60 years. And it's small enough that, and emerging enough that you have, you know, people know you, they recognize you, you have friends. The bartender knows, it's like having a local here in Britain, you know. Uh, the bartender knows your favorite drink when you walk in there, so you feel that sense of community, which is such a precious thing. We all want more of that in our lives. Our souls need to be nourished. So I think there's lots of evidence to point towards the fact that there are these healthy impulses, but we don't want to have some kind of Pollyanna-ish view of the world, that it's all just, you know, the, the so-called new age is going to dawn uh, tomorrow, or it's already here. <clears throat> I think we have to recognize that it's a struggle, and I think that's why I live in America. It's why I live in New York because then that's one of the, that's one of the centers, of the the seat of the struggle for the soul of the future of humanity. Mm -hmm. That came to me one day uh, out on one of the piers in Long Island City, looking over at the Manhattan skyline. Yeah, New York is certainly one of the places where this is all that the struggle is at its uh, at its most intense. Uh, but, you know, that's been the virtue of doing the Open Center over the years. If we can bring this consciousness into arguably the most influential city on the face of the earth, we can really do something because people can say, look, you can do these centers. Well, of course, the Caravan Park in 1962 wasn't a particularly promising environment, but you can do them in lovely rural environments like, you know, Esalen and Big Sur and so on, or Hollyhock up in Cortez Island in British Columbia. But the cities, you know, especially the biggest and baddest, well, of course, it's not literally the biggest, but archetypally speaking, that big, bad New York City, I think being able to do that is a, I think that is a source of hope. And of course, I meet people all the time who've been, whose lives have been benefited by coming to open set of programs. And that's been the great satisfaction for me over the years. It's certainly, <laughs> nobody does this for the money. It's because you have the chance to touch people's lives for the better. And that, and that is ultimately very gratifying and satisfying. So yeah, that's what I'd say. Raphael, it's a pleasure to listen to you. Well, thank you, Roger. I appreciate our friendship now. It's been going on for 40 years. When I did my Fintone Guest Week, uh, I remember in those days, some, a couple of members would come in. It was over at the park, and you were one of the members. And I remember, God, that's great. There's somebody else who's on my wavelength here. Absolutely. So I was so happy to, that I met you my very first week. That would have been January of 1976. And here we are 40 years later. So that's got to say something, hasn't it? We definitely share wavelengths. Put it there, buddy. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right.